So this is the conclusion to the China cabinet storage build and I'm going to start this by making a groove on the bottom part of my cabinet with a rabbiting bit in order to put um, the panel that I have cut in there. Now you could do something like this on the table saw as well, but I have the bit for the router so it's easy enough to just have this clamped in place because it's not glued together yet and um, put that groove in there. Now she, the original photo, the panel's kind of cheated to the front. It's not recessed um, by very much, so that's what I did, which is the nice thing about the router. You can adjust the height of that bit. This is an older bit, so that's why it's smoking, and this is oak, so it's quite dense. But you can see that that groove's gonna be kind of cheated toward the, the top. And then the cutoffs from the backer, which was quarter inch, I'm just going to rip down to size to fit um, in the three bottoms. So this is quarter inch ply, and the quarter inch half inch ply is usually pretty true to dimension. It's the three quarter inch ply that plays around with dimensions. You can see what that groove looks like. So it's rounded over on the edges because I made it with a router, obviously. So I could come in and I'm just going to clean up the edges on the bottom uh, rail there and I'm also going to take it down on the edge styles because otherwise I won't be able to slide the panel in. So finished product, that's what it looks like. There's a little more material removed so the panel will fit and then you could see I continued it down with the router so that I could slide the panel in the bottom and then pretty simple stuff. It's quite similar to making cabinet doors, which are, are fairly easy to make. Line everything up and attach that bottom rail. And then these are ready for glue up at this point. So that's what that looks like. And then there are the three um, finished doors. So glue up is pretty easy. I'm only going to glue the rails and the styles. I like the panels on pieces where I have solid wood um, as the perimeter in this circumstance to plywood. I don't glue the panels because this solid wood frame is going to move the panels. Plywood's um, usually pretty dimensionally stable, so you don't really have to worry about it. But if you glue that panel to the sides, which move, you could have some, some cracking issues. So I leave that panel floating. And then I just put glue on all the tenons and clamp everything together. And then these will be ready to fit into place. I usually let stuff like this set up overnight. I'll glue everything um, at the end of the day. There's my pieces. So the next day I made these so they fit pretty snugly in there. You could see this one just about fits. And this is where I really discovered, because by the naked eye you can't really see little indentations like this. There's quite a severe bow on all of these panels. So I had it so it fit on one side. You could see it's kind of sticking out the other. And what I'm going to do is, in order to make this work, because all of these are going to have to be custom fit at this point, um, that you could see this one's in place and it has the gaps because this plywood's just not flat. If these were fixed shelves, it usually helps alleviate some of that issue. Um, so you can see that one I have fitted in place. And what I'm going to do is I have one edge fitted. You can see I have this edge over here fitted. And then I'm just going to mark where the spots are where the material needs to be taken down. I'm not going to worry about reveals at this point. I'm just going to get it to the point where the door fits inside the frame. So that's what I'm doing. This was a long process. I had it fit in there. I would take off highs and low spots. I wouldn't take off low spots. I would take off high spots and then get it so it fit in the frame. You can see it's still kind of sticking out at this point. I put pencil marks where I needed to remove material. And then I would use um, planes and spoke shaves and, and remove that material. And then I got it to this point where it fit in the frame. You can see there's still gaps, nothing super um, large at this point, but there's going to be gaps on certain sides. So I have part of my reveal with those gaps and part of it I don't have. So then at this point, I'm going to attach the hinges because I'm going to do the reveal after the hinges are in place. The hinges will adjust the doors a little bit. These are inset hinges. So you could always tell inset hinges because I order these because going to the store and buying them is always a nightmare. The hinges are always in the wrong spot. But the inset hinges have this large 
90 degree crank in it. So that's what makes them different than overlay hinges. And these I like because they have the, the elongated holes, which allows for vertical up and down adjustments. Sometimes the Blum hinges only have a circle and um, it gives you no room, no uh, wiggle room whatsoever. So like I said, I'm gonna attach these hinges because they will adjust the way the door set a little bit. So if I do the reveals and then um, um, attach the hinges, sometimes it adjusts, adjusts the material. So it's easier to just, now that they're fit in place, put the hinges in and then um, make, my, make my reveals. So I just have a jig that you could get at the store for these cup hinges. I freehand the holes and then I can attach them pretty simple stuff. Now this door looks like it's bow sitting on my table saw, but that's just because my outfeed table is now too low because I had it set up for the old shop which had the curved floor. So I need to make some adjustments to get it right. And so everything on that table looks like it's not flat when it actually is. And then I could come to the cabinet and make these adjustments. So I've done enough of these that I don't really use the instructions at this point, but they do tell you how far to set these back. So I get that initial measurement and then I go from there. I'm putting three on these doors because they're so long. You can kind of see they tell you to add um, a certain amount in order to set them back. So I make my two axis marks and then I center them pre-drill. Um, that hole in the top is for a, a, a shelf pin, which is why that is there. And then I can attach these. Getting three of these hinges to line up is a little bit of a challenge because these ones I like, I prefer the hinges that clip into place. It's a little bit easier than these. These ones have almost a, a fork on the end that goes underneath that back adjustment screw. But once that's in place, you could see you could slide it in and then you have to tighten that screw. So it's an extra step. The ones that clip into place are a little bit nicer, but um, much more expensive. And then that's how the door attaches. Like I said, these are nicer hinges, so they have three adjustments. They have um, a left to right adjustment, an up and down adjustment, and a little bit of a forward and a back adjustment. So I get them set up nicely so they can they can open in place. And that's what those three doors look like. This one I've done the reveal on. This first one, you can see it opens nicely. There's a nice reveal going around the entire door. And this is a central one I'm gonna do, do next, show you how I did that. So obviously this is a little tight in place with the hinges on there. So you can mark the reveal for something like this with the scribe. Um, I can't find my scribe at the current moment. I feel like that's going to be a common theme after this move. So what I did was I made a little sixteenth of an inch. It was a little bit more than that because this is solid wood, probably like a, a thirty second, a three thirty seconds. And I was it's flexible, so I was able to just line it up with the edge of the cabinet and draw that that gap on the door. Obviously it's not going to be the same all the way around because I have some low spots on these doors because of the way the plywood's bowing, but I get a basic perimeter. You can see up top there's a little less material to remove. In some spots there's no material to remove, but at this point I do have a line. Like I said, this is one of the reasons I can't stand inset doors. I will do them, but they are just a lot more work. And the other issue I have with them is, is people like inset doors because they like the symmetry and that reveal but the problem is this is hardwood so as soon as it gets cold out that it's going to shrink and this was made in the summer so they're going to be about as big as they're ever going to get in my shop which is why i did the 16th of an inch reveal um because they're already pretty pretty expanded but they're going to shrink in the winter time and then all your reveals are going to change they're never going to stay perfect which is which is one of the issues I have with these doors. When you have overlay doors, you don't notice that movement nearly as much. But once I go through and, and plane all of these doors to my line, I can then set them back in place and, and, and that's the basic process. So it does take a while, but the finished process, I don't hate the way inset doors look. It's just I don't love the fact that the reveal will change over time. And sometimes explaining that this customer wasn't like that, but sometimes getting people to understand that process um, could be a little tedious. And then I just veneer, I edge band the back of these cabinets because it's not a built-in, it's a floating piece of furniture. So even though I hate edge banding, I did want to finish the, the back side as well. So these doors are going to have plexi. <clears throat> 
and um, it's it's pretty thin stuff. I forget the exact measurement on this. It's it's some sort of fraction of an of an inch. I think it's a thirty second. So I just go through with the router and I put a very shallow groove on the inside of these doors so that the plexi can be inset on the back side of the doors. And I'm doing that before I apply finish. Obviously these are going to be rounded over in the corners, so it's fairly thin stuff. So I'm just making sure the depth is right. I'll take a chisel and just square up those corners. I don't think I filmed that, but it's pretty simple stuff when you're when uh, you can see it's not super deep. So then for these, like I said, they're getting stained, and I'm gonna pre-stain these. Oak usually doesn't need pre-stain; it takes stain really well. But just for continuity of the the finish, I do put it on there. It's a pretty simple step, and the quality of this plywood. It, it didn't used to be like this, but you could really see the, the demarcations between this, uh, certain panels. So sometimes the pre-stain does help with that. Now the inside of these is getting a brown driftwood color and the outside is getting black. You're not really going to see it in the video, but I actually really liked this true black stain. I hadn't used it before. Um, like I said, you won't really see it in the video, but it's it's transparent enough that you still see all the grain of the oak, but it's a nice color, which, which was kind of nice. And I actually do like this two-tone technique. It turned out pretty nice in the end. The front edge is going to also get the black. The doors will get the black. I put one coat of stain on. And then for the top coat, I'm using a water-based finish because um, this isn't really a utilitarian piece of furniture. I usually prefer oak uh, water oil based finishes because I find them to be more durable. But this is just gonna store some stuff and she, the customer even told me, she's like, I'm probably gonna open these doors maybe three times a year. So I put a nicer grade of finish. I've never used this product before on the, the all the parts you'll see. And I got a much cheaper finish, which was the Varathane Poly for the inside and parts you won't see, just because that can of finish was almost $50 for the, the water-based finish. I'd never used it before. It was well worth it. It was an extremely nice finish, but it would have cost almost $200 to put that on this whole cabinet, whereas it was easily half the price to use a cheaper finish on the inside. And I, I put a coat of poly on all the sides in the back as well, like I said, just for continuity. So then once that was done, I cut the plexi to put in the in the insets. Um, I actually hate cutting plexi. These sheets were also almost $50 a sheet, and it's just, um, could be a little nerve wracking to break it, because I have done, use, if they use the scoring tool like I'm showing in the video with the straight edge, it's pretty simple stuff. But if you don't score enough, this plexi will crack and it could ruin a whole sheet but it was already pretty close to size. You could see I'm just taking a little bit off the top. Like I said, I make a mark, I use a straight edge, and then the scoring tool is pretty cheap at the store. You score a mark. I usually do the front and the back side just to be safe, and then um, put it on a flat surface and you could snap it. So then I could fit this into place. I don't install these until I'm at the house, so I keep the protective coat, coating on there. And I put a bead of caulk around the edge as well. And then I just had these. These aren't super pretty, but I found these cheap. I think they're for screen doors holders, which will hold everything in place. Um, you won't see them from the outside, which is why I used them, because like I said, they're not super pretty, but oak, so I pre-drill everything and just attach these around the, around the edges. And that's how that plexi holds in place. Now I thought I had some finishing videos of, of fit, uh, putting up the doors, but I don't. I also put two um, clasps at the top and bottom to hold the doors in place and obviously added simple knobs, but that is basically what this looks like. Um, I was pretty happy with how this turned out considering the quality of materials available nowadays, um, but that's pretty much it.